everyone deserves to have a moment in the sun everyone needs to feel like life still holds some fun so sing your song and dance your dance milk it for all it's worth yes everyone should have their time to be someone big on earth good evening i'm a proud music therapist and every day that i work with clients i try to make sure that they feel like there's someone big on earth because as you know the world is really really confusing right now and it's really easy to feel irrelevant and insignificant and small until something or someone comes along and reminds you you're not small at all. Every girl and every boy should live without wondering how they'll get to the front of the line without pushing or shoving to speak their minds with new ideas. This right we've had since birth Yes, everyone should have their time to be someone big on earth. Her name was Erdine. She was my first Sunday school teacher. And uh, it w she was your classic 1970s Sunday school teacher. She had uh, cat rimmed glasses. She wore a three piece skirt suit and she had hair that had great height. And she was also uh, the music director and the uh, organist at Second Avenue United Methodist Church in Altoona, Pennsylvania, where I grew up as a, a chubby boy that looked like a meatball. <laughs> there I am, okay, just stay on that picture. <laughs> I, I grew up as uh, <laughs> a chubby little Italian boy <laughs> who spent most of my time making meatballs and then I spent, after that, more time eating meatballs, and by the time I was eight years old, I looked like a meatball. <laughs> My mom tried to <laughs> tell me to become physically active when I was a child. I didn't really want to. Uh, she signed me up for t-ball, which I was horrific, but my team liked me because I brought meatballs <laughs> to <laughs> practice. <laughs> I'll sing again. <laughs> every boy and every girl should live without wondering how they'll get to the front of the line without pushing and shoving. So, um, these are my parents, and uh, my father was a janitor, and um, he only got through the third grade, he never graduated school. Um, and he didn't read or write very well, but what he suffered from most of all was he was schizophrenic, uh, horribly, and every day was a, um, a really horrible day for him to live. He was tortured with his mind and his heart. My mother was um, a secretary, that's the word we used in the 1970s. Uh, she was morbidly obese at her highest weight. She weighed close to 400 pounds, she had unattended diabetes, and she had congestive heart failure. And if I tell you the two things I remember my mother saying most in my childhood, those two things would be, Tommy, I'm sick, and Tommy, I love you. And she loved me with her big Italian heart. So living in my uh, home as a child was pretty torturous. Um, my father and mother, I found out uh, many years ago that they never got married. Uh, they actually met at a bar in Altoona. <laughs> yep, and there I came nine months later. Uh, and they just kind of stayed together, and my mother was very afraid of my father, so she wouldn't leave. I was their only child, and I was the peacemaker in everything they did. And um, I, every day, 
lived with a little bit of in uncertainty and fear. But that's my house, and across the street, there was this church. And every night, I would go up to my bedroom, and I would lock the door, and I would try to lock up the sounds of my parents yelling downstairs. I would pull back the curtain, I would look across the street, and I would stare at that church, and I would pray. Now, nobody taught me how to pray, and nobody told me to pray, but somehow I knew how to. But I guess this is kind of funny. The proximity of my house to this church was so close that I actually thought that the very tall steeple on the top was sort of like a radio tower. And um, I had really good reception with God. <laughs> so I thought he would hear my prayers better than anybody else. So I would pray every night. And then in the morning, coming through the stained glass window, I would hear, I would hear the piano. I would hear the organ. I'd hear the choir sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I would watch all these really well-dressed families going into the doors, into this building with the radio tower on top. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I want to join them. So one day, at eight years old, still in my Garfield flannel pajamas, <laughs> without my parents knowing, I crossed the street. And I walked up the steps, and I knocked on the big red door, and the door opened, and there was Erdine. And she peered over her glasses, and I'm not joking or, or kidding when I tell you what she said. She said, we've been waiting for you. Yeah, so uh, I never knew she was waiting for me. I uh, never knew I was waiting for her. But so I went up to her Sunday school room, and you know there were little desks and little chairs and very well-decorated bulletin boards of Bible st stories, and but in the corner was a piano. So I sat down on the bench, and she sat beside me, and she started to teach me how to play the piano. In the music, there are stars and sunbeams that shine warm. Feel the music wrap behind you and make you warm. She taught me how to play the piano, and she sung with me, and she gave me a place that I was safe. And she was the first person in my life to make me feel like I was someone big. So now, many years later, I am a music therapist. <laughs> and if you're wondering, the big journey from Erdine to here, it all has to do with music. Music therapy was what she was to me. She was an unofficial music therapist. We use clinical and evidence-based research to help people heal. Music is the portal, the stimuli that can make and motivate the body to move, that can remind the mind and the brain of memory that can redirect pain, that can connect you to the emotion you need to be connected to, and sometimes it can even slow down a heart re rate with rhythm, if need be. So after that, after that first year at the church, I um, asked, I begged my mother, sign me up for everything. So she signed me up for tap dance and jazz and ballet. My father hated it. I took piano lessons and voice lessons way, uh, even beyond Erdine. I went out and I just, I, I, I wanted to just, um, I, was, I was salivating to have more art in my life. And then I joined something called community theater. And I was in my first musical. And I was in this musical at age 10. And I saw what was happening. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. 
these people talk to each other, and then when they become too emotional, emotional, they sing. And then, when they even become more emotional and they don't know what to do with it, they dance. <laughs> this is like an amazing thing. This is how life should be. So after that, my mother, my mother bought me my first record player, and it was a Mickey Mouse record player. Do you guys, yeah, some of you had that, right? So Mickey Mouse <laughs> record player, and the arm was here, and the, the glove was here, and this is where the needle was, right? And I only had a few records, but I would sit in my room, and I would listen to those records nonstop, and they took me to a whole different world, and they would cover up my father, kicking his foot through our television set, throwing our fully decorated Christmas tree out the living room window, punching holes through walls, and unfortunately killing two of my childhood pets in front of me. And I would just keep playing them. Then soon after, my mother saw that music was my companion. And she bought me, we had no money, I don't know how she did it, but she bought me a piano. And I put it, or she put it, in the middle of the hallway. And what I started to do, you guys know what movie soundtracks are, right? I would start to play what was happening around me. And I would spend hours creating the soundtrack of what I thought was going on around me. And that's sort of how it is, right? We all have a soundtrack. We all are connected to music somehow. And now, many years later, this soundtrack I use with the clients I work every day. And I know tonight's message is about being a superhero and having superpowers, so I brought a few of them to share with you tonight. Here's our first one. This is Amy. Amy has cerebral palsy, and she hardly has any use of her hands, her arms, and her legs. She's now 22, but when she was 16, she asked me to please help her play Happy Birthday at her 16th birthday party. And so we took her hands, and we worked really hard at getting this one finger to play this. And she did it. On her 16th birthday, she played the entire song. How does music therapy work? Through the eight months of working with her fingers, strengthening her hand, she was able to hold a fork and a spoon better than she ever has before. This next person is Jack. Jack loves music. Jack was a teenager with extreme obsessive compulsive behavior. He wrote a song that he would sing when his habits, his OCD would take hold of him. OCD, you've got a hold of me, but I won't let you get me down. And next we have Ryan. Ryan came to me at age eight. He was basically nonverbal and couldn't speak more than maybe a word, but he could write classical music on a staff paper. So we took the music that he wrote and started to add words and add phrases, and then we taught that to his parents so he could have a conversation. This next one here is Forrest, who is actually in the audience tonight. Forrest is a survivor of a, of a horrific tragedy snowboarding accident. He is now sitting here with you, amongst you, having 31 surgeries on his head and his brain. He was in a coma for a while, lost his voice completely for two years, and through a music therapy method, we found his voice by using pitch and rhythm. Veronica. Veronica has Down syndrome. She helped write a song that goes and tours into the schools about being just like everybody else. I'm like everyone else, my heart beats. 
moments in time. Next we have Scott. Scott was one of my first clients. He has autism. And one trait of autism is they don't give you very good eye contact. So we had this uh, music therapy method. I would sing to him, it's so nice to see you, it's so nice to see you, it's so nice to see you, Scott. And I would look right at him. And if he would look away, this would happen. It's so nice to see you, it's so nice to... <laughs> he went from two seconds to 60 seconds in eight months. And then we taught that to his parents so they could have that conversation with him back and forth. Also, Scott is a survivor of cancer. And last year, he wrote original songs having to do with his bravery. Next, we have Daniel. He has um, Tourette's syndrome. And he found at the age of eight, when he was banging his head against the wall and biting his tongue off, the only way to stop his tics was to create music. 135 songs later, <laughs> he's now in his young 20s, and he performs all over the nation, helping other people with Tourette's syndrome. The lovely lady you met tonight, this is a tour, a musical we have called A Will to Survive. The music is derived from music therapy, and the story is about a young man in Loudoun County that took his life, named Will Robinson. And we uh, very honoredly uh, performed at the Kennedy Center just two weeks ago. And then lastly, this is my stroke survivor choir. There are 25 people who have survived a stroke. Most of them have aphasia. That means they verbally cannot communicate, and some of them can't understand what you're saying. But I can tell you this. They all can sing. And there they are, they're singing with the renowned opera singer Renee Fleming, who's become a spokesperson for them. So lastly, to sum all of this up, why I'm a music therapist. <sighs> Two years ago, I went to see her dean. She was 97 years old, and she was in a nursing home. And I wanted to say thank you. I walked in. She was in the throes of Alzheimer's, and she didn't really have much memory. So I thought the one thing I could do for her is sing. So I did. And then I asked her, do you remember me? And she said, no, <laughs> but I remember the music. She passed away two weeks later. My mother stayed with me and stuck with me and never missed one performance up to my sophomore year of college. And she passed away that year. As for my father, all through my 20s and all through my 30s, he was hospitalized for his schizophrenia. Except, if I can tell you one thing that music has done for me, one year before I opened our center called A Place to Be, I forgave my father completely. And I made a promise to myself that I would call him every single day for at least a minute because he was somebody in this world that felt small and I no longer was. So on the day that we opened up our music therapy center, I picked him up from Altoona, Pennsylvania, brought him down. And my father came into the center and he said, I have two gifts for you. I said, what? He said, first, I'd like to clean your center for you. So he did. And he did his best janitorial work. And when he was done, he sat down in a chair, and I can still remember this moment, and he said, that's done. And then he gave me this, wrapped. So I took it, it was a big night. There were many people there, so I, I don't even know what I did with this. It was still wrapped, I brought it home. Four weeks later, my father died of a heart attack. And I thought when I got the phone call, and, and by the way, the only reason I knew, for all of you that have to forgive a parent, the only way I knew my father passed away because he didn't have many people in his life is because I called him every day for one minute 
And this was the one day he did not answer. I remembered I had this. I unwrapped it. And my father, who could not read or write, wrote this. Now I come to see a place to be where my son will teach his therapy to the kids which teach him to and that's the way it should be at this place called a place to be. And my spirit will always be here, this place called a place to be. So when I think of the people we work with at a place to be, I think that my father was really our first client. So sing your song and dance your dance. Milk it for all it's worth. Yes, everyone should have their time to be someone loved on earth. Thank you.